Warwick is a poet from the Boston er area. And Anna notes that she came to poetry in her childhood when her mother gave her a Robert Frost collection for young people when she was in fifth grade. And what it was important to Anna was realizing that you can tell truth in poetry, that poems are anchored in true words. And since then, she has been sharing her truth in poetry out in the world in different important ways. Anna's publications of poetry include From the Other Room, which is winner of the first annual Slate Roof Press Chatbook Contest. And she also has chatbooks Horizon, Smoke, and Stone. Her work appears in the anthology Kiss Me Goodnight, Poems and Stories by Women Who Were Girls When Their Mothers Died, which was a Minnesota Book Award finalist, and uh, for which she wrote the introduction. And also, she has appeared in a number of literary and interdisciplinary magazines. And her poems have also gone out into the world in other interesting ways, for instance, being set to music performed at Boston's Haydn Planetarium and as part of a contemporary chamber music program by Row 12. And among other awards, she's received the Robert Penn Warren Award from the Cumberland Poetry Review. She's received fellowships, project grants from Somerville Arts Council and was Artist of the Month in Somerville in 2018. And her poem, Remembering My Mother's Face, is inscribed in a brick in the Davis Square area of Somerville at the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority subway station. Anna has also held seminars on understanding grief and loss through poetry. And she's here to share from her chapbook and some of her new poems as well. So please give a warm welcome to Anna Warwick. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction um, and for reading the words of Dr. King, contributing his voice to today, uh, and for supporting the arts and community with this great program, Cheryl. It's wonderful to see familiar faces. Uh, and also thanks to HCAM. Uh, thanks for coming out when you could be in line at the grocery store <laughs> waiting for the <laughs> storm to come. Um, and uh, I will be reading from my chapbook, From the Other Room, uh, by Slate Roof Press, which uh, is a Massachusetts press that um, produces art quality chapbooks. So you choose papers. Um, there's um, an opportunity to choose, choose your own typeface, and there's also um, artwork uh, in it um, so that, that it really becomes an object that supports the text within. And I will read from this and a few new poems. Um, I also want to note that we're starting toward the full moon on Monday, and that is a light that shines in the dark of night. And so this is a book of sorrow, but also of illumination, uh, how we do carry the grief and loss that uh, Cheryl mentioned uh, and celebrate life in this very beautiful world um, that Mary Oliver was so good at pointing out to us. So um, I'll begin with the epigram to the book. New moon snowfall. Sorrow does not leave me. It changes into something I know. In this book, there are two dream poems. I find dreams to be very rich sources. Um, and this uh, is a a dream in, in well, it's a dream about the deaths in my family, uh, and the title is, In Real Life, They Are Dead. My mother and sisters wave from the window of the train. They smile, almost laughing, and nod at one another. They look out at me on the platform. 
and wave again. The train goes, sounding just like a train. The clacking begins, the chrome lines blur, and this departing happiness stays with me like some treasure of the first time, the first time I knew, the first time I knew I was really alive among people and birds, the white lilies and white chrysanthemums. The, this is the second dream and also the title poem of the book. Uh, and it came about because I told a friend of mine my dream. You'll see these, these people were in the dream. I could hear voices. And he said, they are the dead, you know. And I said, no, no, I heard voices. <laughs> the, so he said, they are the dead, you know. In the dream, I hear voices from the other room. So I walk into that living room, but they, a man in a dark business suit, listening to a woman in a blue dress and pumps, are just standing up from the sofa, turning away, plans made toward the doorway at the back. And they start toward the other room where also voices, conversations. They are taking their papers and leaving the room I entered through another door. I never see their faces. The plans, and they are going. Should I? Yes, I'll follow. Unconcerned, they do not call or look back might not even know I am. I never see it, the other room. I am anxious and go to the door that opens into an unlit hallway and their backs spread like ink into the dim. So lest we think that our desire to live forever is something new and the mysteries of what happens is something new, um, I have a couple of poems on archaeology. Uh, it turns out that I was utterly fascinated in grade school when you're introduced to the Tigris and the Euphrates, the, the Fertile Crescent, and that's the, the cradle of civilization. You know, everyone might want to consider the Indus Valley in India or perhaps the Yellow River in China, but for now we'll go with the Fertile Crescent. Um, and, and you may know the Sumerians, and they made cuneiform, and, and the Assyrians came through, and farming. And, um, but in fact, that whole area um, was traded back and forth over hundreds and, and millennia. Um, in fact, you might want to know about the Gutians, the Sogdians, the Amorites, the Elamites, um, the Babylonians, of course, the Sarmatians. Um, so, so a lot of people were trading this real estate back and forth. And they might have thought this way, perhaps. All at once and slowly, the way the Assyrians know King Cyrus with his Persians and arrows is coming. But who can believe it? Working the barley through its seasons in the dry fields, firing the blue into the bricks with wood from the hills growing lighter, eating the bread made by that half Elamite baker down the street, who changes the recipe just slightly, making it crisper with a hint of fire in it. They look up from the kiln, the furrows, to see dust rising miles away, everything changing shape into time remaining, and realize suddenly their own army drinking in the streets 
is the edge of the world. So um, Cheryl invited me to talk a little bit about my process, um, which um, is a generous thing to do. I won't go on too long. Um, <laughs> but um, I came upon uh, a quote from an artwork by Banksy, um, who uh, is, is a street artist. No one knows what he looks like. You wake up in the morning, and in Tokyo or London or Boston, you will see um, something stenciled, usually a figure, onto the side of a building. And also, he had this quote. If you're willing to do something that might not work, you're closer to being an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my book of things that might not work. <laughs> I always carry a notebook with me. Um, frankly, sometimes I write from the back, sometimes I write from the front, um, just thoughts that occur to me. So I thought I'd, I'd do, um, I'd look at this, this collection of notes. It's just two stanzas. I can tell you I have no idea why I made a stanza break. It's not actually a poem, but it's notes for a poem, and it becomes this poem. So I'll, I'll, I'll read this, and I'll talk a little bit about the process. This was completely off the top of my head, and I'll let you know the background a little bit, but you'll hear some of the background. You will hear the news cold in the blue eons of beleaguered birds, the insects diswinged, the mixing of brown and white bears that cannot swim, uh, the ones that can swim, but for drowning, choice is a desperate strait. You will hear the news, O oh, beloved dead, who in your time also swept up debris and flood. We have not changed, though change clangs all around us. So when I sat down to write, there were a few things I wanted to save. I very much wanted to save Cold in the Blue Eons, but actually it didn't make it into the poem, so that happens. Um, I liked the animals. Um, I liked some of the words like diswinged. I allow myself to, to make up words at times, and to me diswinged suggested the, the act of our ecolog ecological damage. Um, the bears, you know, the polar bears are threatened, and they apparently are mixing with the brown bears. Um, and this address of you, as a poet, you have to be a little careful of that. I had to figure out, what did I mean by you? I meant me and us. And we have not changed. And I thought, well, what do I really want to say? I don't want this to be simply another woe is me um, poem, but it came out like this. Other things, repetition, repetition is useful, um, circling back when you get to the end of a poem to, to sort of reference what you've also um, mentioned to begin with uh, in some way. Uh, so this is called um, Jeremiah. Uh, the book of Jeremiah is known as a book of lamentation from the Bible. I haven't read it, um, but it's like a Job book or um, also lamenting that the people he's preaching to, he's a prophet, are not listening to him. Jeremiah. Digitized news. Fluid, omnipresent. Repeating calls of flight-weary Rangeless birds, insects diswinged, multisexual frogs, brown and white bears mixed into ones that can swim but cannot haul out to live. To hear the powerless broom sweep up debris and bones the abandoned changes clang their final bells again. Choice, a straight, not straight, hemmed in by fire. We 
will be old when the elephants disappear. Others will be young. Uh, so the other thing that came in, of course, is that image in the California flyers, the fires of people fleeing down the, down the roads with fire everywhere. So that came in. Uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, okay. So um, I'll read another from um, my chapbook. Uh, and my mother died when I was 16, which was, um, of course, a difficult moment. And yet, when we go through these things, um, we sometimes find help and anchors. This is about my 12th grade English teacher. The Outline. In 12th grade, Miss Warren kept me after English class to ask, do you know this paper doesn't make sense? I looked at my three typed pages. So she showed me how to outline and arrange thoughts. I'd learned all that younger, but had forgotten the patterns when death scrambled my bones with my mother's. Miss Warren and I sat by the oak desk, and she led me step by step back to reason, asking what I wanted to say, asking what I thought might come next. She would wait a long time in silence, patiently, because she saw I had to go a long way off to recollect something that answered the question and did not signify the impossible, which I had learned when death took my mother away. And once I had accepted the impossible, what was there to say? It disturbed me to look at the faces of my classmates to see their guileless self-absorption. But when Miss Warren said, A, leads to B, leads to C. And you can number inside the letters, one, two, and three. I learned that to think again was not to betray what I had witnessed, but to follow a map that led to her oasis, where she had us reading James Joyce, to learn epiphanies, how things come together, or must come apart and you can see it in a glance or in the snow. Later that year, too tired to do drugs or sit in a car's back seat with a boy, I went to Miss Warren's house for tea. I told her my mother hadn't died of cancer, like I'd said to everyone, but of alcohol, and my father was drinking again. And she said, it's a surprise, isn't it, when you know your family isn't happy? A, B, and C. One, two, and three. So um, for a complete change, I'd like to read an ekphrastic poem. I do love that word, and you probably know it means a poem inspired by uh, art, a piece of art. There's a journal called Visual Verse, an online journal. Every month on the first of the month, if you're on their email list, which you can Google and get on, they send out an image, a contemporary artist image. They're all very different. There was actually a cartoon this month, which I didn't reply to, but the... Um, where are we? We're in January. In December, um, it was a, a brush painting by a Korean artist of a figure, a wild figure, wearing red, uh, and Korean, uh, what I would call kanji, I don't know what they call it in Korean, the Korean lettering. Uh, 
So, um, well, gosh, golly, the color red, hmm, red ties, hmm. So um, I hope you haven't been as obsessed as I have. <laughs> This poem is entitled Individual One, and for those of you who lead a calm and beautiful life, um, Individual One is the unnamed person in um, Attorney Michael Cohen's uh, letters, court, court papers, uh, for his indictment while he was, and conviction while he was going to, going to go to prison. Uh, so this is Individual One, and again, it's inspired by this um, figure. This is very different, though. The bald man waves his arms, chanting sacred curses he makes up himself, while the chorus of his hair attempts Mahler, thick and thin, in surprising spots that fascinate. Here, misdirecting the truth of what needs saying. Red tie, red Christmas trees, red pockets laden, but at a particularly vigorous gesture, the heavy gold belt his girth requires falls away to reveal the old script, once tucked out of sight, that gives cues and bells to deputize ignorantly brutal devils. We've seen it before. He isn't embarrassed, so I am embarrassed for him. One wing sprouts from his side, but aerodynamics, he was too impatient to learn, state he cannot lift off. His whirligig shouts and satellite dishes focus and refract back his own words, his own spectacular crucifixion impending. Again, the curses, but they are smoke and mirrors, his art the broken embers that burn the palace down around him. <laughs> so um, here is another uh, dream and archaeology combined. Uh, it's called Relic. No wonder I'm losing my memory. At night, I dream in another life and cannot gather the fragments to let you know where I've been, where you might be going. In the dream last night, you were not there. In another country, I dug the earth. The small, broken clay cup meant that others had once prayed here. This excites me beyond what I am seeking. Then I see them dancing. And I need to tell someone we are not saved. The cup rough in my hand, flutes and drums play, Cups are broken, and I run, then awake. How foolish to expect to remember keys, bills left on the counter. How many teaspoons of sugar? Well, where are we now? I have a little more time than I thought. <laughs> um, let's see. You know, I'll read the triolet. If you've ever done a triolet, um, it's a very particular form, and you'll hear it. It's very short. I have seen dead, but I am not. I write this, so it seems I live. The sinking body stills and rots. I have seen dead, but I am not. My sisters slipped beyond life's knot. Gone. Oh, what I wouldn't give. I have seen dead, 
but I am not. I write this so it seems I live. And the last one I'll read is the, um, is the one actually in uh, Davis Square subway station. Um, bef well, in, in happier times. <laughs> um, when the, when, well, you probably know this, the red line and the orange line both have installations of poetry and art, which in the case of the red line was one half of 1% of the cost, the federal dollars that went into the red line. So, um, so we're not expensive artists, are we? <laughs> um, so they have actually um, uh, 11 poems into the bricks of the Davis Square subway station on your feet. So they're, they're quite lovely ones. There's a couple up top and then on the platform, there are most of them. So this is on the platform. And this came about actually as a result of looking at William Blake's catalog. He did a catalog of pottery to make some money. Very beautiful, of course, very simple. Remembering my mother's face. The face is a jug of water drawn from a well. Smooth, soft, the eyes arched handles. I look and look hard to hold her. She smiles. How I am that smile and the water spills. Thank you very much for your kind attention. for